Donald Trump becomes the first former U.S. president convicted of felony crimes. This was a rigged trial by a conflicted judge who was corrupt. It's a rigged trial, a disgrace. Israel says its war in Gaza will likely continue through the end of the year. We're seeing intensification uh, of the military operation in Gaza. We want a humanitarian ceasefire. Civilians need a humanitarian ceasefire. And how much would you pay for a McDonald's Big Mac? Since the end of 2019, the average price for a Big Mac went up about 20%. The average cost for all menu items is up 40% over the last five years. Today is Friday, May 31st, and this is VOA's International Edition. Good morning, I'm Lori London. We didn't do a thing wrong. I'm a very innocent man, and it's okay. I'm fighting for our country, I'm fighting for our Constitution. Our whole country is being rigged right now. A defiant Donald Trump outside a New York courthouse after a jury late Thursday afternoon found him guilty of falsifying documents to cover up a payment to silence an adult film star ahead of the 2016 election. Associated Press correspondent Michael Cisak begins our coverage. Jurors deliberated for about nine hours over the last few days before delivering their verdict. Trump sat stone-faced, stoic, looking down as the verdict was read in court. He then grasped his face with his hands, looking exasperated as he heard the jurors affirm the verdict. Guilty, 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 34 times. Trump glared as he left the courtroom. He shook hands with the only family member he had there today, his son, Eric Trump. Then he went into the hallway and railed against the decision. He called it a disgrace. Trump will be sentenced on July 11th. He remains free on his own recognizance till then. But this count, this charge, carries a maximum punishment of up to four years in prison. It's certainly possible, though, that Trump could face some other punishment. He could be subject to probation or a fine. That was AP correspondent Michael Cizak. And for a closer look at the implications of the first former U.S. president in the nation's history to be convicted or joined by former CIA officer and criminal defense attorney, Jack Rice. A little bit astonishing. To call this historic doesn't even do it justice. We've been hearing this now, this word over and over, but this is actually something else. To actually see a former president of the United States convicted of not just one, but 34 felonies is really quite astounding. And frankly, for those who are simply looking at the criminal justice system, there is this question of whether or not the system is fair. Now, for some, maybe it's just the people who wanted him convicted. I think the real question becomes, is there anybody above the law? And I think today they would say the answer is no. In fact, even a former president can be convicted of a crime. We've never seen anything like this in the past. So this is a a really amazing day when it comes to what that means. For those who are saying that this was all, as the former president just said, this is a shambles, that uh, this was all a setup. This was part of the legal witch hunt. You're going to see that crowd continuing to voice that opinion, too. So you have both sides. You're seeing sort of tearing apart of the country, in a sense, that schism that we have seen over the last eight years and then some really starting to highlight itself in the wake of these decisions. If you were to round up what these guilty charges mean, these 34 charges, basically say? A jury of 12 determined that former President Trump, when he was running for office, essentially falsified business documents. And there were 34 counts separately against him. But what this was really about was not just the documents themselves, it was why it was done. So it was a combination of the documents themselves. But if you actually add what this was about, this was about the election, if you will, too. So that was both sides of that. But again, I think what makes it so dramatic is that this wasn't just one count of 34. This was every single count where this jury came back unanimously. And you can understand just how dramatic, how uh, amazing, frankly, historic, we come back to that word, that we have that you have a jury of 12 people, just everyday, normal, average Americans who are sitting in judgment, which they do every day across the country for defendants, to actually have a former president in the box, essentially the defendant in this case, 
and then having them judge him. That is part of what makes this so astounding, because this doesn't happen in most places in the world. And frankly, this has never happened in the United States before. And so when you see that, it really does show an extraordinarily unique system that doesn't happen every day and certainly doesn't happen in large swaths of the world. What happens next? President Trump's team certainly has the right to appeal and they're absolutely going to do that. So you should expect that. At the same time, what you're going to see in New York is they would do a pre-sentence investigation and ultimately there would be a sentencing at a certain point. Usually it's several months before that actually takes place. Now it's likely that what will happen is that's going to be continued out as well for a whole series of reasons. And I would expect that Trump's team is going to try to avoid a sentencing in this case, even before the election itself. Now, I doubt that the judge is going to allow that because we're talking about, at this point, about five months. And that is extraordinary, even when it comes to New York on this issue. So I expect to see a sentence But that sentence may not come down until September, October, potentially. Could he go to jail for this? Or what could be the ramifications of this verdict for him as far as sentencing? Former President Trump could go to prison for this. He could also be sent to jail, if you will. So in other words, he'd be serving less than a year. And if that were to happen generally in New York, that would be at Rikers Island. Technically, that could be the case. At the same time, because this is essentially a first time for the former president, there is the potential that, in fact, he could simply serve probation, meaning he'll never serve a day in jail. But that doesn't mean that the conviction doesn't stick. That doesn't mean that he would have a whole series of requirements and oversight by the system itself, which is what we see all over the country for all sorts of defendants who are found guilty or plead guilty to charges. Now that he is a convicted felon, does that hinder his ability to be president? Former President Trump has the right to continue to run for office and even to be elected. Now, what makes this different is that this is state court, not federal court. Because of that, he doesn't have the ability to pardon himself. In other words, because he has been convicted, and unless this is overturned on appeal, that means that that conviction will stick. He can't stop it. He can't change it because of his power, his pardoning power as president. That only applies to federal uh, laws, federal courts, not to state courts. But it does not stop his ability to run for office or even to win and serve in office as as, uh, the next president of the United States, if that were to happen. Criminal defense attorney Jack Rice, thank you so much. Thank you. We're following these other stories from around the world. Iran opened a five-day registration period Thursday for hopefuls wanting to run in the June 28th presidential election to replace the late Ibrahim Raisi, who was killed in a helicopter crash earlier this month with seven others. Partial results from South Africa's national election have shown the African National Congress appeared on course to lose the parliamentary majority it's held for 30 years in what would be the most dramatic political shift since the end of apartheid. And nicotine alternatives used in vapes being sold in the U.S. and abroad may be more potent and addictive than nicotine itself, according to findings from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and independent researchers. Israel's military says it has taken control of a buffer zone along the nearby border between the Gaza Strip and Egypt, giving it effective authority over Gaza's entire land frontier. We hear more from Associated Press correspondent Karen Chamis. The seizure could complicate relations with Egypt, which has warned against an increase of Israeli troops in the area. The move comes as Israel has deepened its incursion into the southern Gaza city of Rafah. A top Israeli official, meanwhile, has said Israel's operation in Gaza could stretch through the end of the year. I'm Karen Chamas. Also Thursday, Slovenia's government endorsed a motion to recognize a Palestinian state and asked the parliament to do the same. It comes just two days after Spain Norway and Ireland recognized a Palestinian state. Tensions between North Korea and China surfaced publicly this week for the first time in years. 
the apparent rift between the two allies emerged as North Korea's attempt to launch a spy satellite interrupted a major diplomatic initiative by Beijing. VOA's Bill Gallo has more from Seoul, South Korea. This wasn't the first time North Korea has tried to launch a spy satellite, which it wants to monitor U.S. forces in the region. But the launch, which ended in a fiery explosion shortly after liftoff, was unusual because of the timing. North Korea announced it would conduct the launch, just as China's premier was set to meet the top leaders of Japan and South Korea. It was a rare North Korean disruption of a major political event involving China, its main ally. A small detail, perhaps, but analysts say it hints at trouble in the relationship. Jean Lee is a Korea specialist at the East-West Center. North Korea is very strategic in the timing of its launches. They do not do things by chance. The timing left China's premier in an awkward position, as his counterparts condemned the impending launch. Things only got more awkward. After a joint statement called for the denuclearization of the Korean peninsula, North Korea erupted. In state media, North Korea's foreign ministry accused the three countries of interfering in its internal affairs. Again, Jean Lee. The fact that they mentioned China as well really jumped out at me because I think it hints at the fissures in this relationship between North Korea and China. The last time North Korea criticized China was in 2017, when Beijing backed UN sanctions over the North's nuclear and missile tests. Since then, ties have improved. China now opposes new sanctions. But some analysts see signs of trouble beneath the surface. Chinese leader Xi Jinping hasn't met Kim Jong-un in over five years. Ramon Pacheco Pardo is a professor at King's College London. I think that if China and Xi Jinping especially wanted to show that there is a close relationship between itself and, and, and North Korea, uh, Kim Jong-un have been invited uh, already to China or have been essentially dragged to China to meet with Xi Jinping. Uh, and this hasn't happened. Kim has met with Russian President Vladimir Putin, who now uses North Korean missiles to wage war in Ukraine. In return, Putin may be aiding North Korea's nuclear weapons program, according to U.S. officials. Some analysts say China may be uncomfortable with a significant nuclear buildup on its border, which may help explain the current tensions. Again, Ramon Pacheco Pardo. China is trying to show that it is not as close to North Korea and to Russia, uh, to be honest, as uh, some imply. But all three countries have seen their relations with the United States deteriorate, meaning they may continue to find plenty of reasons to cooperate. Bill Gallo, VOA News, Seoul, South Korea. VOA's International Edition continues. I'm Lori London. For nearly a month, the eastern Ukrainian city of Kharkiv has been under sustained fire from Russia. Well, now, according to four U.S. officials, President Joe Biden quietly has authorized Kyiv to fire American weapons inside Russia. We have details from Associated Press correspondent Sagar Magani. Officials say that allows Kyiv to use American weaponry in Russia for the limited purpose of defending Kharkiv, which is under Russian assault. They stress the policy that Ukraine not use those arms to mount offensive strikes in Russia has not changed. The move comes a day after Secretary of State Anthony Blinken hinted at a shift. At every step along the way, we've adapted and adjusted um, as necessary. Ukrainian officials have been stepping up calls to allow their forces to defend themselves against attacks coming from Russian territory. This morning, NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg urged Western nations to reconsider any restrictions. I believe that the time has come. Sagar Magani, Washington. The U.S. presidential election now five months away. And both candidates, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, have very different views on the production of fossil fuels and the need to transition to clean energy to fight climate change. VOA's Veronica Balderas Inglesias looks at where each candidate stands and the agenda and the agendas they'll champion if reelected. 
During his time in office, President Joe Biden has made his views on climate change clear. My administration, the United States, has treated this crisis as an existential threat from the moment we took office, not only for us, but for all of humanity. Biden has expanded energy options, including solar and wind power. He has also put limits on oil and gas development on federal lands. Environmental advocates want more. Apart from just climate change, uh, we have uh, very rare birds and species across the American West, which are deeply impacted by this drilling. Simply ramping up clean energy is not going to do enough without actually phasing down fossil fuels as well. If Biden wants the green vote in November, he'll need to make more changes, recess. It's critical that he take action to show that he's actually willing to confront fossil fuels because that is what will actually incite environmentalists. Uh, that is what will actually get them uh, from perhaps reluctantly voting for him in November to actively recruiting their friends, turning out, uh, knocking on doors. Former President Donald Trump has a radically different agenda for his possible return to the White House. We're going to drill baby drill right away. Yeah! Drill baby drill. The U.S. Senate Finance and Budget Committees are investigating an offer that Trump reportedly made to oil companies, saying that if he receives $1 billion in campaign donations, he will roll back climate change regulations if he's elected U.S. president. What is certain is that the oil and gas industry thrived under the Trump administration, says Kathleen Scama, president of the nonprofit Western Energy Alliance. President Trump championed uh, domestic oil and natural gas and tried to make the United States an energy superpower. And we have achieved that status. But despite the energy industry's criticism of Biden, Zgama says it will work with whoever wins the White House. We would hope that the Biden administration would, if reelected, would uh, have overregulated as much as it could in the first term and that would maybe take a step back in the second. With the Trump administration, we would hope some of this would be overturned. Uh, the unlawful overregulation um, could be corrected. Analysts expect the election results to have a domestic and global impact, as it could affect the U.S. role as a climate leader. Veronica Valderas Iglesias, VOA News, Washington. For the first time, the United States will co-host, along with the West Indies, for the International Cricket Council's Men's T20 World Cup. Despite its overseas popularity, cricket remains largely unknown in America. VOA's Mohamed Atif has more. American audiences will see a sport that originated in England and is dominated by nations like India, Pakistan and Australia. In the opening match, the U.S. faces fellow T20 newcomer Canada. And captain Monak Patel is confident of victory. We played like five games and uh, we won all the games that, uh, against Canada. So we've been doing really well. And uh, as you said, um, good to be playing against the top teams in our group. So I think every game will be important. Cricket in the United States has been driven by the growing South Asian community. Fans are eagerly awaiting cricket's biggest rivalry, India versus Pakistan, on June 9 in New York. Tickets sold out instantly. Harry Singh serves as the chair of the local host committee for the T20 Cricket World Cup tournament. The best thing we could have done, being in the population of Indian and Pakistan community here in New York, and this couldn't be a better place than New York to host their match. Amir Ahmed Atozai is the Council Journal of Pakistan in New York. I've been able to meet the community. There is a lot of excitement. Uh, they are upbeat about uh, this uh, event and also the specifically the match, uh, which is the mega match of the event. Cricket, traditionally a long format game, has evolved with the shorter 2020 version. The fast-paced three-hour format known as T20 was introduced in 2003 and has attracted people who pre Previously avoided cricket due to its length. Cricket lovers hope this will help the sport grow further in America. Kurt Lee Ambrose is a former cricketer who played for the West Indies. 
Cricket in America could make a big difference, and especially the T20 format, because we know in America, the Americans want everything to finish in quick time. So I believe this T20 competition is going to be a success. Team USA is hopeful that the tournament will spark a passion for cricket among all Americans. It's all pretty surreal, to be honest. Um, look, I think it's hugely exciting, not just for you know myself and the guys you know in the USA team, but I think cricket globally as well. Whether you're a lifelong cricket fan or new to the game, this T20 World Cup promises action, excitement, drama and unforgettable moments. From big hits to 90 miles plus bowling speed to nail-biting finishes. Cricket fever is set to sweep America. Mohamed Atif, VOA News, Washington. And a whopper of a price tag. McDonald's is fighting back against viral tweets and media reports that it says have exaggerated its price increases. AP correspondent Jennifer King reports. McDonald's U.S. President Joe Erlinger says reports suggesting the price of the average Big Mac have doubled since before the pandemic are exaggerated. Erlinger says he and many franchisees are frustrated by a viral post on X about a Big Mac meal in Connecticut that cost $18, calling the price an exception. McDonald's says the average U.S. price for a meal is around $9.29. The fast food giant saw a slowdown earlier this year as inflation worried consumers dined out less often. Since the end of 2019, the average price for a Big Mac went up about 20 percent. The average cost for all menu items is up 40 percent over the last five years, with French fries up 44 percent, which they attribute to higher costs for labor, paper, and food products. That's nearly twice the rate of cumulative consumer inflation. I'm Jennifer King. This has been International Edition on The Voice of America. That does it for today's show. On behalf of all of us here at VOA, thank you very much for listening. For pictures, stories, videos, and more, Follow VOA News on your favorite social media platform and online at voanews.com. Until next time, I'm Lori London. Next, an editorial reflecting the views of the United States government. When Taiwan's new president, Lai ching De was inaugurated on May 20th, he was greeted with messages of both congratulation and intimidation. The United States, along with leaders from Japan, the United Kingdom, the European Union, and others, sent congratulations to Taiwan's fifth democratically elected president. In a statement, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken praised Lai and the Taiwan people for once again demonstrating the strength of their robust and resilient democratic system. Secretary Blinken said, we look forward to working with President Lai and across Taiwan's political spectrum to advance our shared interests and values, deepen our long-standing unofficial relationship, and maintain peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. However, the People's Republic of China, which regards self-governing Taiwan as a renegade province, deplored the congratulations from world leaders and sent a message of its own. Beijing launched dozens of Chinese warplanes and Navy vessels over a two-day period in a complex military exercise that modeled a blockade of Taiwan. This is the latest in an escalated campaign of threats and intimidation the PRC has conducted against Taiwan in recent years. In a statement, the United States expressed deep concern over the People's Liberation Army joint military drills in the Taiwan Strait and around Taiwan. Spokesperson Matthew Miller said, using a normal, routine, and democratic transition as an excuse for military provocations risks escalation and erodes long-standing norms that for decades have maintained peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait, which is critical for regional and global security and prosperity and a matter of international concern. The United States rejects the PRC's attempts at intimidation. As Pentagon Press Secretary Major General Patrick Ryder said in a statement, the U.S. Defense Department remains confident in current U.S. force posture and operations in the Indo-Pacific region with our allies and partners to safeguard peace, stability, and our national security. We have closely monitored joint military drills by the 
People's Liberation Army in the Taiwan Strait and around Taiwan. We have communicated our concerns both publicly and directly. The United States, he said, remains committed to its long-standing one-China policy, guided by the Taiwan Relations Act, the three joint communiques, and the six assurances. That was an editorial reflecting the views of the United States government. 